You're staying with the Monday Report. You're just in time for the town hall session. Tonight, we talk about a nation on the brink with rising political temperatures and also a dwindling economy. We have ANC party leader Musale Mudavadi joining us this evening. Thank you so much for making time. Thank you. And a powerful audience made up of experts and questions and concerns. Tonight, they get to ask the questions directly to the leaders who are up there and also Musale will tell us what is running for president but that at a later time all right let's start with what what do you think is really ailing this country honorable well first of all let me just take this opportunity to wish the audience uh, uh, prosperous 2020 and indeed even the Kenyans who are watching from wherever they are um, there are several issues but I would put the issue of the economy as the first uh, challenge that we have. We are not doing very well economically. There are a lot of statistics that are being churned out, glowing statistics that tend to give the impression that uh, we are doing well. But in reality, where it matters, creation of jobs, uh, the cost of living, uh, the need to make sure that um, there are not mass layoffs that are beginning to emerge. The issue of the huge public debt uh, that is gripping us and it's translating into higher taxation uh, by the day. And then massive corruption. Um, all these, uh, in my view, are really the core things that we should be addressing as a nation and as a people. Okay. How do yeah. you think they should be addressed? Because, we, for example, you've spoken about the economy. You've been a minister of finance before. Yes. What should be done so differently now? Well, I think it's, it's, it's interesting that um, we have kind of gone full circle in, uh, in, in, uh, from the time that I was a minister for finance. One of the things that was hitting Kenya very hard then was, uh, of course, excessive uh, public debt. Uh, many years ago in the early 90s, late 80s to the early 90s. And this stifled growth in our country. All the resources were either going to pay, repay debt, we reached a stage where we could not repay some of that debt. And then of course it was running parallel to matters of corruption yeah. uh, at the same time. So when you look at it, it's as if almost 30 years later uh, or thereabout, we are back to that spot. We have excessive um, public debt. And I've been talking about this for quite some time. I started talking about it in 2015, sending signals that uh, Kenya is on the wrong path when it comes to borrowing. Uh, there is what you call concessional borrowing and there is commercial borrowing. Mm. And unfortunately, for some reason, uh, this government, the Jubilee government in place, went more for commercial borrowing. And this is where the leaps and bounds in our public debt has come in. Okay. Now, commercial borrowing, uh, for purpose of the viewers, is expensive loans, shorter repayment period, higher interest rates. So some of the loans that the government uh, has engaged in yeah. are actually due for repayment in only 15 years. But when you talk of concessionary loans, you have loans with a very low interest rate and you can repay over 40 years. Okay. So unfortunately, in the last few years, the government went out there with an appetite that is not understandable for commercial loans. Would you sum this as poor governance? Um, yes, in a way it is. And yet because, people use because, support. Because you have to make a prudent decision. Borrowing is not a crime, but you must be able to borrow uh, in a manner that you will be able to repay uh, within some levels of comfort. But we, this month alone, you've seen, and it's uh, in the public domain, yeah. that uh, we have been servicing the interest rate on the SGR. But now the principal amount is due. Okay. And there's going to be a very heavy payment in January. And these are going to escalate to a very huge amount by June okay. uh, this year. Now, this is going to bring a strain yeah. on the Kenyan shilling, and it's going to bring a strain on the Kenya revenue targets. I find that very perplexing, Andre, but what, what do you really stand for as a leader? Because these same people you say, uh, you're alleging a poor governance and their governance is poor, 
you supported both of them. You've been uh, running Made for Huru in 2002, Raila 2007. What is your position but, on but, all these but issues? But isn't it, isn't it clear? If, if we focus first on the economy, uh, because you've jumped into the political realm already, but uh, if you are to talk about uh, the aspect of the economy, and I think it would be important, because, uh, sorry to say, but I feel we are uh, putting too much emphasis on politics and running away from solving matters around the economy. And this is the same people make the right. decisions? Now, you will recall that as far as I am concerned, that is Musalia Mudavadi as ANC, I am not in government. As we speak, I am not in government. I am firmly within the opposition realms. So when you say I am supporting, yes, we were ran on the same ticket with Uhuru Kenyatta, in uh, 2002, but we did not form government, mm -hmm. all right? He has formed government with a different combination. Now the challenges we are seeing are with him at the helm, with his new combination, not with Musalia Mudavadi. So you think the issue is the combination and not him as a leader? Professor, I'll bring you in on this concern. <laughs> what, what, what do you read into this? What are your concerns? Uh, thanks, uh, uh, I think. Uh, uh, this is very interesting, and I, I fully agree that uh, that uh, our economic fundamentals uh, leave a lot to be desired. In fact, really, I mean, we are we are in red already, um, uh, and, and 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 literally we know that for a fact that uh, whether you're looking at uh, big business, whether you're looking at small businesses, whether you're looking at Mamboka, whether you're looking at uh, you know civil servants. Um, there's basically no money in the economy. Uh, the banks are lending nobody money. The people cannot repay and all, all that. Um, yeah, which I fully agree with. Um, secondly, uh, I think uh, at the core of this really is governance issues. I mean, we, we don't need an economist as a president. In, incidentally, our president is meant to be an economist. <laughs> incidentally, <laughs> we need the country's systems of governance and institutions of governance. Yeah. And these systems and institutions of governance is not just about the president and his deputy. And uh, one of the key questions that I must ask, really, to those in the opposition is what exactly is the opposition doing about this? We know, for example, I mean, we have um, the parliamentary debt committee that is that, that is actually meant to be looking at uh, you know government debts. These are the same people who have pushed uh, the ceiling just the other day to nine trillion. Um, they approve. Um, uh, government debt. Um, we have the Parliamentary Budgetary Committee yeah. where also opposition people sit. And, uh, you know, when th those people speak, you know, you think that uh, they come from some kindergarten somewhere and they've never really seen those budgets uh, as, uh, as it actually were. Uh, and the question has been that uh, these other institutions that we created uh, to ensure that there's prudent governance, yeah. including management of the economy, what exactly are they doing? Yes, uh, the president and his deputy are mismanaging the economy. Yes, the Jubilee government are mismanaging the economy. But where is a money? Where is ODM? Where is the position? Where are the members of oversight committees, yeah. both at national level and 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 at county level? Okay. Uh, where is the oversight? Um, I mean, uh, at national level we have this chaos, but at county level, mm. what is even more exciting is that. Uh, the opposition-led counties, uh, fortunately, Amani is not leading one of them. But um, um, my own county uh, of Siaya is no better ran than the Republic of Kenya. <laughs> Uh, and, and of course, we know uh, the chaos that's happening in our capital city. Yeah. And, 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 and in a lot of these places, these urban counties are being run by, by, by the opposition. The key okay. question still is, why are we paying members of opposition, why are we paying opposition political parties, yeah. and what exactly are they doing, are they doing All right. in terms of dealing with this uh, uh, quagmire that okay. we're in? All right, just pass the microphone to Echesa, but also you'll respond to that, Honorable Musali, yes, just yes. right now. I think it's easy if you just respond directly. Well, I think, I think on this one I'll, I'll fully go with the professor, that uh, the reality is, on a broad scale, the opposition in the country has let the Kenyans down. This is the reality. Um, I would be cheating myself and cheating so many people there if I said that we have actually played our oversight role effectively. We have not. Um, 
in certain instances, the professor is right. Yeah. We have even been seen in certain circumstances. You can see debates in parliament where parliamentarians within the opposition ranks look more government yeah. than the government uh, members of parliament themselves. So this is a reality. Yeah. And uh, we as, um, uh, as, as, as uh, uh, ANC are taking it seriously. And if I just to want to pick up the issue around the debt, uh, in the course of this year, one of our members uh, is pushing forward a bill uh, which is going to focus further on the issue of debt and how debt should be managed uh, in our country. Uh, we want to be able to push this, uh, bring more transparency around the issues of debt management, yeah. uh, and we hope that uh, parliamentarians who want to be on the right side of the Kenyan people going into the future will be able to support this so that we can know what debts we engage in, yeah. what are the repayment modalities, what was the money used for, etc. And uh, were there any personal benefits to particular individuals and if so, for what purpose? Okay. So these are very critical issues because they eat into the very fabric of our growth okay. and uh, we believe that that is a challenge so on this one uh, professor I don't think I can give any other excuse but to say that um, the way the political scenario unfolded yeah. uh, the opposition uh, has not lived up to its role. so if you yeah. failed as an opposition what makes you think you'll succeed when you have power well what when I say that uh, we have failed uh, it does not mean that we cannot do it better. All right? Uh, we are seeking to take over government. Remember, we had our aspirations as opposition, as NASA. We set out our blueprint. All right? Um, maybe we'll discuss the issue of elections and electoral, ele electoral justice a little later in, in this forum. But at the end of the day, uh, we are ready to offer an alternative, do you given the opportunity. You still haven't answered my question. But Why if you failed as an opposition? No, 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 no. no. It, does not, in, it, does not, it does not. It does not mean that we have failed. I've said there are shortcomings. Okay, we have failed to some extent, okay. not totally. All right. There's another question here from Harriet back then. Then Jero teach. Go ahead, Harriet. Um, thank you very much. Um, for me, I think when we talk about uh, the role of the opposition and where we are sitting right now, we have seen quite a lot uh, of issues going ro uh, wrong and one of them is the independence of institutions. And again, this is one area that uh, when we talk about the judiciary and where it's sitting currently, the voices of the opposition also has been very quiet. And that is one area that even as we get into the next leadership upfront, it's important that the leaders that are coming up should take up uh, these issues and allow the institutions to be able to be independent and for them to be able to serve the interest of the common manainchi. The other key area that I would wish to point out is the element of the youth in this country and the excesses that come up in terms of uh, employment. We have a population base of about 56 million. Currently, as we speak, we have uh, about 3 million Kenyans in employment. Uh, when we talk of the economy and the equilibrium, as we talk about um, the generation of income, and currently, as we speak, the high level of taxation targets most people in business and those who are in employment. And this is one area that you find that the three million Kenyans can still not sustain the gaps that we are currently experiencing within the economic uh, equilibrium. So what then uh, is your leadership thinking around that? How do we empower the youth women? How do we create job opportunities? Because these are issues well entrenched within the constitution. But you find each and every political party, their manifesto talks about these issues. Uh, like almost it's, um, it's a given piece of cake. But ideally, these are issues that we need to deal with uh, uh, within the leadership sphere. Okay. The other key important thing that I think we should be able to talk about is BBI. Currently, as the youth in this country and uh, those young people who are coming up and the general, um, and the general uh, public, we are looking at 
an environment whereby the leadership in this country now become more cohesive. We have had uh, elections periods or within the electioneering period and even after where the youth women are most affected because they become the conduits into delivering the political class. But what then happens? We get into um, a political crisis and those who suffer more are the same youth who don't even have employment opportunities. Okay. We now have the BBI report, which currently talks about cohesion. But then we are seeing a political class that is also divided in terms of what really do they want okay. in terms of churning the leadership of this country forward, in terms of have us having a country that is more of um, uh, uh, a political, like we are able to embrace each other regardless of yeah. uh, your political inclination. Okay. But then this is the same kind of leadership that is also trickling into institutions. So it is also important that we get to know where is your standing uh, 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 as a leader in this country, okay. more specifically being in the opposition, yeah. and uh, where do you see this country uh, in the next 20, 15 years from now? Okay pegged on the current situation and All where right. we want to drive this country. All right, pass the mm -hmm. microphone to Jerry say but then she's raised three fundamental issues there. Yes. And what is your position on the BBI, by the way? Well, can I listen to her? You, you want to take all the yeah. questions first? I'll, I'll, I'll I think listen. it's easy for us to address yeah. them directly. Okay. But let's take the second one. All right, Jero all right. Tich, go. Thank you. Good evening. Um, my name is Chero Tich Sei. Uh, Honorable Mudavadi, it's good to have you with us this evening. You know, when I listened to your, to your introduction and you were talking about the state of the economy and said, let's not uh, bring politics into this, it, it reminds me of, of uh, dealing with the victims of road accidents and not addressing the fact that the state of the roads has a lot to do with what uh, with, with the accidents that occur. So when you talk about separating economy from politics, and yet politics drives what happens economically, I, I find that a little bit problematic. But I'd also like to say that I do not think that impunity in terms of corruption and, and other um, illegalities started with Jubilee. This goes back, uh, way back to independence. And one of my big concerns is that there's a culture of denial of responsibility at the very top. Um, I heard you say that you're not in government right now. This is a well um, trotted out uh, statement by many uh, politicians who who are not currently part of the Jubilee government. And I say, you know, where does accountability start and where does it stop, Mweshimiwa? You know, when we think back, uh, you've been in, in, uh, in politics and also in government since 1989 or thereabouts. Uh, you were there um, when, when uh, Goldenberg happened. You were there during Anglo, Anglo leasing. Um, you know, you talk about how you did so much work to bring to an end uh, Goldenberg and to, to, to rectify and turn around the, 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 the ship that was sinking because Kenya was in serious crisis then. But Anglo leasing looks a lot like Goldenberg. I'm not an economist, but you know, I wonder how on your watch once again, some of these things happened and you deny wrongdoing there. Um, you deny whether it was a Mavokos land cemetery issue. You didn't. Th there's a culture of constant denial, and eventually, when 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 held to task or asked the tough question, uh, politicians say, "We're not in government. Stop asking us those questions." So it comes back to say, if there isn't a culture of integrity, a culture of accountability and culpability beyond just vagueisms of saying, yes, we have failed you, but to actually say, you know what? If in 30 years I haven't been able to turn this tide around, and I know you cannot do it alone. It's like uh, turning the Titanic alone. Why should we as Kenyans continue to trust the political class? It's playing Russian roulette with our lives. And as a trained land economist, if you look at issues such as the Community Land Act 2016, still sitting in Bunge, I know you're not in Bunge, that hasn't been um, uh, deliberated or passed. We're looking at millions of shillings 
way leave compensation in the north of Kenya and in all other, in many other counties that haven't been paid out? Isn't land a factor of economy? Isn't this a way to bring about a level of pr prosperity? Yet land is being given constantly to foreigners. So when I look at all of this, I look at your specific expertise. If there was another uh, political leader on the on 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 the stage where you are, I would ask the same questions: Where does it start and where does it stop? And why do we keep passing the buck? Is this why President Uhuru Kenyatta thinks that the debt is sustainable? Who is he fooling? How are we going to recover this money? The debt that we're in is successive decades of plunder and looting. And in some of those uh, uh, decades of plunder and looting, you are in government. So I, I really find it hard when I, when I see you know, such eminent persons as yourself uh, sit there and say, actually, we will make a difference if we have another chance come 2022. Good. All right. First of all, um, I'll uh, respond uh, to some of the issues you've raised, and then I'll come to the issue raised by uh, the other lawyer. Um, first of all, let me just state that when I talk about Goldenberg, it was a challenge that I faced. But I've never shied away from speaking about it, because I faced it, I confronted it, I brought it to an end. All right? because it was a system that was a botched up policy of export compensation and it was not going in the right direction. So I terminated that process. Now, over and above that, I am a Kenyan who then faced public scrutiny on the process of Goldenberg through the Judicial Commission of Inquiry. So I have gone through the mill, if I may put it that way. And if there was going to be any wrongdoing that I had committed, it should have come out many years ago through the Judicial Commission of Inquiry, which, by the way, was conducted when I was an ordinary citizen. I was not a member of government where I would have been accused of influencing the outcome of that inquiry. So that is one thing. On the issue of the Anglo leasing, I have been a state witness Again, I faced the mill. On the other one, the investigators did their job. The issue of the symmetries in uh, Nairobi, they did their job, and they saw no reason uh, to implicate me in anything. So on that, I will not shy away from saying that. But be that as it may, when we say that I am not in government now, or you're not in government now, there is need for us to also learn from the lessons of previous regimes and be able to take corrective measures. Now, I see some positive things. For instance, when the challenges were there, uh, for instance, the Goldenberg uh, agenda, there was no anti-corruption institution. But over the years, Kenya has now built the Ethics and Anti-Corruption uh, Commission. All right. As to whether it is fulfilling its mandate appropriately or not, that is another, another matter. But we have seen that there's been some progress. And we have seen also that there are some people now in Kenya who are also facing challenges on aspects of the management of public space. So that is important for Kenyans to understand that there is progress. But I strongly believe we could do better. And I believe those of us who are here are asking these questions because we know that we can all do better. So that is one thing I'd like to look at and to encourage people to look at. And as far as I'm concerned, we have got to work more about the water. There was a statement I once made here that the person or the Kenyan who deserves least sympathy in this country is actually the Kenyan voter. Because it's the Kenyan voter who year in, year out makes those moves, gives some of us, if I may put it that way, the mandate. Yet there's overwhelming evidence before them that we are not fit to hold certain positions. So that is an issue that 
we must also work collectively as Kenyans and address the Kenyan voter on this matter. Now, if I come back to the issue of uh, the BBI as an example, all I can say is that on paper, the terms of reference give a very good focus. But it is how the process of executing the BBI that raised the issues and therefore it lost a lot of goodwill uh, from the public. It has been perceived and continues to be perceived as more of an agenda for a few people rather than a holistic agenda. I remember saying at the Bombers of Kenya a few days ago when they launched the report that for as long as the perception will be that the BBI is there to create additional positions for the political elite, it will not gain mileage from the general Kenyan populace. Is that your reading as well? Because you've read the report. Yes, that, that, is, that is, that, oh yes, the way it is being crafted, mm. it, is, it is a challenge. We have to deal with it. We cannot run away from this, that we have to squarely understand that for as long as the perception is that we are beginning to talk about positions and saying Trevor is going to hold this position, Mudavadi is going to hold this position, and so and so is going to hold that position, and we are spending all the time, the headlines every other day are about individuals and perhaps even the salary they will earn, then we are misleading the public again. We are diverting attention from the what might be positive around uh, the BBI. So we have even seen what you might call ethnic mobilization around BBI related issues. You know, the, you're being put out there and you're told you're either green or yellow, or you're either blue or red. And we have seen movements that show that some politicians want to start mobilizing ethnic sentiments around the BBI. Yet, I think it is item nine of their terms of reference, it is very clear that one of the things that the BBI should fight is ethnicity, negative ethnicity. But what is happening now, politicians are mobilizing, whether you are for it or not, whether you are for the referendum or not, they are already beginning to mobilize as if they're mobilizing their ethnic groups. Okay. That is dangerous and right. it could mislead us. Uh, let me touch a little bit on the judiciary as an example. She talked of the independence of, of institutions. Yeah. That is true. Um, we are seeing uh, a dangerous trend where independent institutions are being undermined. Either they are undermined through resource allocation, through parliament, uh, the executive, they are basically three arms of government and we all know them, the executive, the legislature and the judiciary. But we have seen tiffs, we have seen battles of the executive and the judiciary. They seem to be undermining each other. Mm. At least that's the perception. For instance, the judiciary demanded or requested for a budgetary allocation of about 2.5% of the budget. Mm. They got 0.7%. Now, if you're going to fight corruption, do you need the judiciary as an ally or do you need the judiciary as a complainant? These are fundamental issues. Um, I don't know if there are lawyers in this room, but the lawyers know that there are cases now, and thanks to the land issue that you bring, which is core to our economy. If you have a land matter, and you go to the magistrate's court or the land court today, you are being given dates as far as 2021 for the first hearing of your, of, of, of your client's matter that relates to land. Now, if this person is going to rely on this land for purposes of economic advancement, and you're telling him that the legal issue around it will be had in 2021, but we don't know when it will be resolved. The guy will be dead before the matter is even, is even listened to. Okay. So there, there are fundamental issues here. And, and, and I would say that uh, let us respect the independence 
of the various institutions okay. and let us fund them appropriately. All right. Yeah. I have to take a very quick break, but I see there's still very many questions coming up. When we come back, I'll give them an audience to ask all those questions. Keep your views coming as well on 22422. That's SMS line at Trevor Mbijak, Citizen TV Kenya. Use the hashtag Monday Report. We're back in just a bit. It's your turn to ask all the questions. I'll just sit here. <laughs> see you in a bit. <laughs>